Hey everyone and welcome back. So in this video we're going to carry on from where we were and we will start implementing the functions into our C++ class. So we've set everything up ready now. I'm going to go through this in order and just go down the page and add things in in order. So the first thing we want to do is we probably didn't need a whole construction script for this but um, we're just going to use this to initialize our current level index. So we'll get the current level index and we'll just set this to zero to make sure that we don't have any weird references because we're going to use this for going through our array later. Could have put that in the begin play now I look at it, but that's fine. Now in the begin play, we did forget previously to add our super call. So we're going to say super begin play, just so that we can make sure that this class does the initial begin play stuff and the setup before we do any of the uh, custom functionality we're about to put in. Now after this, we want to set the reference that we have to our controller. So we'll say controller and this will be equal to the world controller. So we'll say get world and we want to get the first player controller. So again, this works because we're using a single player game and just like within blueprints, this is just going to get the player controller with index zero. Now with that stored, we can actually access this and start setting things. So we want to set the input mode. So I'm going to say controller set input mode and we need to pass in a reference to the type of input mode we want that to be. So just above, we're actually going to create a local variable and we're going to call this one input mode and it will be of type F input mode game only. So you can see here, uh, before I close this off with the autocomplete, we have input mode game and UI and the game only. So we want that one. And as I said, we're going to call this input mode. And then inside of the controller, we can just pass in the type of input mode that we've just created. So this is just going to tell it to be a game only type again. And like I mentioned in previous videos in the blueprint section, this is just so that when we come off of the menu, that's still going to be in the menu type of input mode. So we just want to make sure that we get control of our pawn. And then the final thing we want to do for the controller is to remove the, the mouse cursor in case that's there. So we'll say controller and B show mouse cursor equals false. So quite simply, again, that's just getting the Boolean variable inside of that class and setting it to be false. Now with all of that done, we can check our levels. So we'll do our check level function and we'll start implementing this one. So at the moment, this is actually going to be quite simple. And we're going to come back and this is going to look a bit more complex later. And as I mentioned previously, this is going to be our kind of broken version, but purposely so. So this is what I wanted to show that the C++ way of getting the level names and stuff doesn't actually work in the editor properly. But there's a way around that and I just want to show the kind of steps that you take because if you were to Google all of this and use the standard documentation, then you're going to be seeing the kind of process and setup that I'm using now. Um, and as I said, that may not always work. So we're going to create a local variable called current level name and it will be of type F string. So we've got our current level name and we, to get this quite simply, we're, again, we're going to get the world that we have. So get world and we want to get the map name. Okay, so we'll find out what the the map name is that we're currently in. Then we're going to access our levels array and we want to find something within this. So levels.find current level name, which is the, the one we've just made. And we also want to populate and fill or update the uh, current index. So this is why we need this to start at a correct number. We didn't want this to be something higher or lower than the number of elements that we have inside of our array. And then from this, we want to check whether the current index is less than something. So current level index is less than levels.num. So again, we're just getting the number this time, the number of elements inside of our array. And we want to make sure that we take one off of this because it's a zero based array so that we don't go past the number of levels it has. So all of this is probably looking very similar to the blueprints now. And what we want to do is if we are within this range, then we'll say that the next level equals to levels. And we want to get the current level index plus one. So the next level is going to be the level that we're on plus one in that in the array. And then after this, if that has failed, so if that hasn't been the case, or if we're outside of the array bounds, then we're just going to assume that we are on the final level because we don't have any more levels to load. So I'm going to say that next level equals, and we're just going to fill this with a custom string. As I said, we're filling this manually, same as we did previously. So we'll just call this one end. Because remember, that's how we do our check later. If the next level equals to end, then we're going to call the game over screen rather than the next level menu screen. So in the moment, very simple function. And that one is the kind of standard implementation you'd expect to see. This is going to work if you build the game, but it won't work in the, in the editor. So we'll come back and we'll see why later. So moving on, the next thing we want to do is our end game. So if we've reached the end of the game, we want to get another local string variable. 
and this one we're going to call level string. Again, we're just going to get the map name. So get world, get map, same as we've done just a second ago. And then we also want to get the next level to load. Now, <laughs> when you get the map name, it's returned as a string. When you pass in the level to load, you pass in a name. So we need the F name and we're going to do a conversion. So we'll say level to load equals F name. And then we're going to pass a reference in of the level string that we've just got. And that will be ready for us to use now. And remember at the top of the script previously, we have added in our Kismet gameplay. So we can access this now and we can say that the U gameplay statics, we want to get a function in this called open level. And we want to, uh, the reference using this is going to be this, the, the class that we're in. The next argument is the level to load which we've just called level to load. So that's our name that we've just created. And we just want to finish this by saying true. And true basically just means it's going to clear any options or anything we might be passing through. On the next level, that will be reset. It's not actually relevant to the way that we're loading levels, but for some reason I found that not using that caused an error that I couldn't get rid of earlier. So I'm just going to go with it and I'll fill it with the default value. Um, and again, that is our end game ready. So that's that function taken care of. So we'll move on to the level complete function. Now, quite simply here, what we want to do is if the level's complete, we want to first of all check our user widgets are set up correctly. So again, this is going to make a bit more sense in a moment when we go back to the editor, and I'll show you a few reasons of why we've set things up the way that we have. So first of all, if the default level complete widget, so we'll say if default level complete widget. So we're just checking if that actually exists, if it has a value inside of it. Uh, if that's true, then we want to set the level complete widget to be the default level complete widget. So we'll say level complete widget equals create widget. It's going to be of type u user widget. Again, we want to do the get world. We'll break that off with a comma, and then we will set it to be the default level complete widget. And we can close that off. So that's that bit done. So at the moment, we've created the, the widget itself, but the same as, as we found with the blueprints, if we don't do something with it, then at the moment it just exists and we won't see it. So the next thing we want to do is get our level complete widget. And we just want to do the same thing as we did previously, and that is to call the function add to viewport. So that will now be displayed on the screen. Now, if this returns false, I'm still going to let the game continue, but I'm just going to provide a small uh, warning log to either our future selves or the developer you might be handing this over to. So we'll say that else. So if the default complete widget doesn't exist, then I'm just going to use a, another UE underscore log, log temp again for the verbosity and the type will be warning. So it's not an actual error. It's not going to break anything. It's just going to be a warning and a heads up. And the text, we're just going to say uh, no default level complete widget selected. So this is just going to remind us that in the blueprint, we actually need to fill this value with something. As soon as those checks have been done, the next thing we want to do is we want to set up a timer. And I don't think we've actually created that timer handle. So if we go back to the header, uh, just under the widgets, I think we can do this in the protected. We just want to create an F timer handle, and we're going to call this level swap timer. So in the C++, we'll go back to where we were, and we want to get world timer manager. Okay, so world timer manager uh, with an R there. I always, for some reason, personally forget to put the R there and just call it time manager. We then want to set timer. So this is just going to be our little break between the widget showing, giving a couple of seconds for them to read that and then loading into the next level. We're going to use the level swap timer that we've just created. We want to call it from this class. We want to get a reference to a function on this class. So we'll say the A, see our game mode. And the function is obviously going to be the load at next level. The next argument is going to be the duration of the timer. So that's two seconds. So two float seconds. And then the final argument we need is whether or not this is looping. And of course, we only want this to happen once. So we'll say false to the looping Boolean. Uh, with that done, we have our timer ready to go to our next level. So if we fill this function in, that should be everything for the moment. So the first thing when we're loading the next level is we'll check if the levels array, so we get the levels array again, contains a certain variable. And that's going to be the next level itself. So remember, we've set this either to be the name of the next level that we have available to load, or we've set it to be the string end. So if the levels array contains uh, either map one, two, or three, then we're going to do something. Otherwise, we know that we're on the end level. So what we want to do here, again, we need the uh, conversion to an F name. So we'll say F name level to load equals F name. We'll pass in the reference of the next level. So whatever that is as a string, we want that to now be a name. And then we can use the U gameplay statics again. And we want the open level. 
we want to open on this and the level to load. And then same as we did previously, we'll just set that to be true as default. Okay, so that's all good. If we have a level to load, if we're on level one or two, then we have level two or three to open. If not, then we want to do something else. So else. So this time, um, if we, we just wanted to do that same check we did in blueprints to make sure we don't have any existing widgets on the screen. So we'll say that if level complete widget, which is the one that we've created up here just a moment ago. So if this is currently still on the screen somewhere, then we want to simply remove from parent. So level complete widget, call the function on that, remove from parent. So we now have a clean and empty screen. So we can now check whether or not the default game complete widget's been filled. So we can do the same as we did previously. We'll just check whether or not it has a value. And then if it does, we, in fact, we're gonna do exactly the same thing we did here. So I'm just gonna copy this from the level complete setup, tidy this up with a couple of tabs. So what we want to do is if the game complete widget, the default version exists, then we want to change this to be game complete widget. And we're gonna say, we're gonna create a widget again of the U user widget type. And we, rather than being the default level complete, we want this to be the default game complete. And then we want to change this to be the uh, game complete widget add to viewport. Now, the slight difference with this function is that we also are now entering back into a menu. So we want to get our controller again. And we want to say that the B show mouse cursor should be true. So we'll set that to be true. And we want to create another input mode. So F input mode again. But this time we want it to be UI only so that we have full control over clicking into buttons and things. So we'll say input mode. So we'll call this input mode again, and then quite simply get the controller and do the same thing we did previously, which is set input mode. But this time we'll pass in the new input mode, the local version we've made here. So input mode again. And then all I want to do is if this isn't true, so if we don't have the default game complete widget, we're gonna do the same as we did previously. So we'll grab this else statement. We're gonna paste this below that one grab these and tab it along. And we can just change this. So we want the same type of log, but we can just say that we don't have a default game complete widget available this time. So really doing the same thing, just a safety check that if we haven't filled this in the blueprint, then there's nothing to show. So with that done, I think that's everything set up. So we can go back to the engine and we can try and give this a compile. Okay, so that compilation failed. We'll find out what happened. Uh, we will show the log. Current index is undeclared. I think I called it current, current level index. So we'll go back. Yeah, so I called it current level index, didn't I? I just forgot to put the level in there. So we will just save that and try and compile again. Just thought I'd leave that in just in case you were copying line for line what I put, then you may have the same error. So that has worked correctly now that we've spelt that correctly. And what I wanted to show is if we go back to the uh, C++ classes, I don't think we already have a blueprint based on our C++ class. So at the moment, we only have it based on the, the pawn C++. So if we go back here, find our game mode, and we'll right click and create a blueprint based on that. I'll remove the my, and we'll call this bp underscore cr game mode, just so we know that it's different. Put this back in the blueprints folder, and we'll create a class based on that. Now the first thing, we'll just get this out of the way, is make sure that we set the default pawn class to be our cr pawn, and that means we can start using this. It's not gonna work fully because we don't have all of the colliders and the collision set up for the end game and the obstacles. But what I wanted to show, is I mentioned in the last video that we have some of these exposed when we don't need them to, just so that I could demonstrate what's happening. So we have our default level and game complete widgets, and we also have our level and game complete widgets. Now, the reason we have both of these is the, the ones which don't have default in front are a reference to the U user widget class, which is what we need to pass in to create them. But if we were to try and fill these in here uh, with anything, it doesn't really matter, and hit compile, then as soon as we compile this, they, they get removed because it's not expecting a specific reference to a type that we've created. It's expecting a reference of that class itself. So the way that we're doing this is that we need to fill in the default level complete with the level complete widget and fill in the default game complete with the game complete widget. Now, if we hit compile, that will save, which is perfectly fine. So back in the code, why this is important is that what we're doing is when we're coming down here to our level complete or the um, the next level, we're checking whether the default version has been filled because if it hasn't been filled, what we're gonna try and do otherwise if we're not doing this check is we're gonna try filling another variable with a null variable that doesn't exist, which is they're the kind of things which cause um, crashes and they make quite hard compilation errors to, uh, 
to track down sometimes as well, especially in bigger projects. So if you ever think you're going to be passing in something that may not exist, maybe because you're handing this over to a designer and obviously they're not going to know the code as well as you, they may forget or not realize they have to fill something in in Blueprint. And if that starts crashing and uh, causing errors, then it may be harder to track down. So you just put a simple if check here. And then if that wasn't filled, then you're just going to give them a nice little uh, warning to say that needed you to fill this in and you haven't go back to the Blueprint and check something like that. So as I mentioned, if you wanted to, you can now remove these. These don't need to be viewable or editable because these are all going to be the level complete and the game complete widgets are going to be updated in code. The ones that we need access to are going to be the default and the uh, default game complete widgets. So with that done, we can go to the project settings, go to the maps and modes if you're not already there, and we can change the BP game mode to be our BP CR game mode. And nothing's really going to look that different at the moment if we press play. Uh, remember this starts with the default game mode anyway, uh, one that we've overridden for the menu specifically. But now if we go to the next level, we can see over on the side it is using our BP underscore CR game mode. So that's all being used properly. I had control of the player if I wanted to play with him, if I wanted to interact with that. But as I said, we're not set up any of the obstacles or anything, so that's not too important at the moment. The main thing is that we now have our own C++ based game mode ready to go. And we actually have most of the functions filled in. As I said, we're going to come back and update the level select because at the moment, if we could actually transfer from one level to another, this wouldn't work in the editor. And I will explain that when we can start demonstrating it. But I try not to get too far ahead of uh, where we are in the tutorials. So I'm going to leave this one here for today. As always, if you've enjoyed this or found the video useful, then please do leave a like and share the video around. That really helps and is always greatly appreciated. To be kept up to date with any of the content from any of the playlists on this channel, then don't forget to hit the subscribe button. As ever though, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.